Hey everybody, welcome back to the I Play 2 podcast. I'm your host, Rob Adler. This week, former North American Soccer League player Cleve Lewis joins the show. Cleve played college at Brandeis, where he scored the game winner in overtime to bring Brandeis its first national championship in any sport, and Cleve was named MVP. Cleve became the first African American to be drafted in the NASL, which was the precursor to the MLS. His brother, Carl Lewis, is a multi-time Olympic gold medalist and one of the greatest track and field stars of the 20th century. Cleve, welcome to the show. Thank you, Rob. It's great to be here. Thank you for being on the show today. The first question I have for you is, how did you get into soccer? My dad was my coach in Little League growing up. He was my baseball coach and my football coach. And when I was about 12, the league that I was in, you could only be 120 pounds. And if you were bigger than that, then you couldn't be in that league. So my dad wanted to find something for me to do. And they had just started a soccer program in my town, Willingboro, New Jersey. So he signed me up for that. And that's how I got started. What intrigued you about soccer when you first started playing? To tell you the truth, it was just something to keep me busy. And then I had some friends that had played soccer prior to me playing. And they were the ones that encouraged me to be in the league. And I didn't know anything about soccer, nothing. I was a strictly baseball, football, basketball guy, track guy. But as I got in, I liked it. I did very, very well my first year that I played because I was faster than everybody. And they used to kick the ball down the field. I would be the fastest one to the ball, get there before other folks and have time to gather it and score goals. So they were like, wow, you're great at this. But I really didn't know what the heck I was doing. I was just faster than most folks. But one summer, there were some English players that played in the second division and third division in England. They would come over to the U.S. and paint houses in the summer for extra money. And they would go over to the field where we played and they would play after work. And so we started to play with these English folks. And again, these are semi-pro guys. So they had skills. And that was the first time I really saw what the game was truly about when we started to play with these English folks. I can still remember one of the guys that used to work with me. His name was Pete Hatton. This is way back in the late 60s. That's how far back this goes. Once I started to play with them, I started to see how the game was really played. They would fake you out with the ball. They had great ball skills. They were more technically sound when it came to playing. And these are some of the things that a lot of Americans had no idea about at that time playing soccer, especially in the level that I was playing in youth soccer. There were no coaches, no one's dads, unless they were immigrants or came from another country, really knew how to coach the kids and give them the right type of foundation that they needed to be a good player moving on. So I think that was the first time that I really felt that it was something that I was very interested in because I wanted to get more technically sound and be good with the ball, understand how to juggle the ball and control it like they did. And that's when I really started to like the game. You mentioned one of the players named Pete. How much was he able to help you in terms of actually showing you what you needed to do in order to get better? There were things like collecting the ball, that you would watch how they did it, just the way that their body movements were, and things like that, that you saw as you were playing with them. And then afterwards, you would say, how did you do that? And they would show you sort of, or you would practice on collecting the ball, like off your chest and then trapping it, or the way that they strike it and things like that. We would practice on little things like that from a skill perspective. And it was not just me. There were other guys that I played with, and just about all of these players that I played with, with youth around 12, we played high school together. Most of us got college scholarships. And they went on to become starters in Division I teams in college. So it was not just myself, but there were others that benefited from not just Pete, but some of the other English players there as well. It was really a fun time. 
and I really liked the game. It was very interesting because I played basketball. It was like basketball. You had to learn how to dribble. You had to learn how to shoot. You had to understand the movements of the other players that you can get the ball to them and things like that. So I played basketball in high school as well. Also played football. I ran track. Back then, a lot of uh, athletes were three-letter athletes. So during soccer season, I played that. Basketball, I played that. Track, I did that. It wasn't like today where a lot of these younger folks, they're choosing one sport at 12 years old, and that's what you do. You don't do two and three and like we used to do. There's still athletes that do double up and things, but not like it used to be. You did everything. You mentioned how the skills of basketball and soccer are similar. How have each of those games evolved in your point of view from when you played to today? I looked at soccer today is like basketball. If you go back to the early 70s, you had a basketball team where the guard handled the ball. It went to the forwards who would handle the ball a little bit and they would go to the basket a bit more and, and rebound and that was type of thing. And then you had a center that basically stayed down low and you got it in and he had the least amount of skill. OK, it used to be like that in soccer. The fullbacks or the back players generally didn't have very much skill and they were just defensive only. They didn't come up the field a lot and score a lot and those type of things. The midfielders were the field generals and then you had the forwards were the scores. And they generally were the ones that had the ball handling skills and they were the fastest and the quickest and those type of things. So I think if you fast forward today, when you look at basketball, you're looking at a center shooting three-pointers. They didn't used to do that. You're looking at guys like Kevin Durant with ball skills that can handle, that can shoot, that can rebound. They can do everything. And it's the same way in soccer or football, as they call it in Europe. You have players in the back that are very, very skillful players that can move to the front and that can score as well. So I think those two sports have evolved similarly over the years. And when you look at players today, you find players that might be in the front and that might move to the back, like Davies for Bayern Munich, the place for Canada. He started out as a forward in MLS, and when he got there, they moved him to the back, and he's one of the top backs in the world today. So... I think that the game has evolved and it has changed, but you have to be a lot more skillful today and technically sound today than you did when I played. Soccer in America back then certainly was not as popular as it is now. Can you kind of describe what the popularity was like and how hard it was to try to get clips of actual games? Well, put it this way, when I was in junior high, I played, I was on freshman football. In my town, you couldn't play varsity as a freshman. We weren't even in the same high school. But I was one of the better athletes on my football team, and I was going to go play football. I started, I was one of the captains on my team and everything else playing football. But I had been playing soccer up to then. The three years before that, I played soccer, and then I went and I played football again because I was one of the faster, better athletes in my town. But everyone played football then. That was the thing. And they looked at soccer like a sissy sport, so to speak, that other sport that you played. And many of my football teammates could not believe that I was going to play soccer over football. And so it was a little bit different back then. So if you wanted to play, it was a very ethnic thing. There were a lot of immigrant clubs around town, especially in Philadelphia. So you had the Polish Americans, you had the German Americans, you had the Italian Americans, and they would have these clubs where they would have a football team or a soccer team, and they would play in a league. And so that's how we spent our time as far as developing our skills. And many times we played alongside with a lot of these older men that used to play in their countries and things. They might be 35 or 40. 
have a business or working in Philadelphia and they still wanted to play the game or they might have played back in their youth and they were still playing. So we would play with people like that. And in doing so, you would see a lot of the different types of skills or the way that they played. The English played different than the Italians and the Brazilians knock the ball around and have fancy moves and things like that, where again, England, they played a more physical game and long ball game and things like that. So you started to kind of understand the different types of ways that people played. And I was always a friend of Brazilian play because when I was a junior in high school, I went as an exchange student to Brazil. I went to Sao Paulo and I spent a summer there as an exchange student and I played in the streets with these Brazilian kids And when I came back and just seeing their creativity and playing the way that they play and all of these kids that were really, really good, but they were never going to go pro or anything like that, gave me confidence that when I did come back to the United States, it was like I got three or four years in six months or a year as far as technical ability and skill and understanding the game and the quickness and all of that. And I think... That was one of the reasons that I was able to accelerate my skill level so quickly. I think that really helped out a lot. What was it like just to go from South Jersey to Sao Paulo? Was there any kind of culture shock there? It was. I think I was 14 or 15 when I went down there. But, you know, I stayed with a very, very nice family. It was kind of a middle-class neighborhood where I was, and I just enjoy the experience. I had never been out of the country before. My parents were great. They were ahead of their time, I think, for a young Black family to be doing things that they did. And we were not wealthy at all. Both my parents were teachers, and they would spread it together to give us experiences and let us do different things, like playing in the soccer league at that particular time as a Black youth. Again, as you said, coming in, I was the first African-American, meaning born here and grew up here, that was drafted into the North American Soccer League. Now, there were plenty of other Blacks and probably Black Americans that were there, but they were born in Trinidad or they were born in Africa. Or they were born in Haiti or somewhere. Soccer was the main sport and where they had stars and they had leagues and they had those type of things. I was kind of really early on for a black youth that came up through playing literally football and baseball that switched over to soccer that had success. But there were other guys that lived in my neighborhood that were African-American that played soccer, that were good soccer players that played on my team. They just didn't go to the levels that I did, but they were very, very good. They got scholarships to college and did well and things like that. But uh, it was very hard getting into the league back then, because unlike the MLS today, you are only required to have two Americans on the field at one time. And in many cases, those were goalies. There were a lot of goalies that started in the NASL. And then there was one other field player that had to be on the field. Now, there were times that you have two and three, or or maybe even more Americans on the field, but you probably never would see more than three or four on the field at one time. We basically were vying for these two or three or four positions to be on the field. We were all up against each other for those three or four spots. The rest were professionals from England or South America or Mexico or whatever. They were the ones that were actually on the field. And many of them were the over the hill players, right? They had finished their careers. They were 35 years old or in their 30s and they would come over and they would play in the league. Now, naturally, they had the skills needed and the technical ability needed to be at that higher level. And they were all generally better than all of us. But it was always great to see Americans on other teams and we would converse with them. What did you play? How did you grow up? What did you do? And there are a lot of players from New Jersey. So I knew a lot of the players just from high school and playing around in New Jersey. Matter of fact, 
two guys on my high school team, Dave Grimaldi, and Dave played with me in Memphis. He also played for the Dallas Tornadoes. And also, Tony Bellinger was a really good player, great player that played professionally, outdoor, indoor, for 13, 14 years. Tony also played for the U.S. national team. So these are players that I played with in high school that we learned in our town, in our city, that we used to kick the ball around with and learn together and brought ourselves up. And the year that I was a senior, I think out of the 11 players that was on the first team, all New Jersey, which I was on first team, all New Jersey, I think I led the state in scoring that year and stuff like that. All 11 were in the NFL within four years. The recruiting process for any sport today is very, very different than what it was then. What kind of recruiting process did you have? Yeah, there was. First of all, New Jersey was a hotbed for soccer in the U.S. St. Louis was big back then. Some really good teams and things like that are areas in California. From a recruiting standpoint, remember back then there were no club teams like the club teams are now. So you would recruit from the high schools just like they did in football and basketball and baseball. And so I looked at the University of Pennsylvania because I was right there in Philadelphia. They looked at me and recruited, but I wanted to go away from home and I didn't want to go to a school anywhere near where I grew up. That's how I was, right? I wanted to adventure and I wanted to go to a top school. So I ended up going to Brandeis because Brandeis was like an Ivy League school and I had no aspirations to play professional at all. I was wanting to get into a really, really good school so that I can get out and do the best that I could with a job, right? Brandeis was not known for its soccer program. I just went because it was a very, very good school. It was a great school to get into. I tried to get into Brown University, but I didn't get into Brown. That was my first choice, and they were Division One. I. I guess I didn't study hard enough. <laughs> and Brandeis was Division Three, but both very, very good academic schools. So that's why I didn't go to Hartwick. If I would have gone to Hartwick, I probably could have done a lot better in soccer because it was more so of a soccer school than academics. Talking to UCLA, Terry Fisher was the coach back then. Then he went to the Washington Diplomats. Those coaches knew who you were, and that's how I got recruited. Now, Brandeis, Mike Coben was the coach of Brandeis, and he reached out to me, and I read up on the university and how great the university was. And when I visited there, I really liked it. It was a smaller campus. They talked a lot about the team, but they really, really were focused on academics and what you can do coming out of that school and how it would prepare you. I was big on that. And another school I looked at was American University down in D.C. I thought I looked at really, really good colleges. Again, academics was first, soccer was kind of second, but I feel I made the right choice. I met some really incredible people at Brandeis. One of the players that I learned a lot, and again, I like technical play. There was a guy by the name of Bernard Roy. He was from Haiti, and this dude was smooth as ice on the field. I mean, his skills, the way he moved, I learned a lot from him, and he didn't even start because he was a smaller guy and kind of fragile and stuff. But, I mean, you could watch him all day long. How hard of an adjustment was it when you got to Brandeis? My freshman year, I led the Greater Boston League in scoring. And I got there and just completely tore that whole league up. And there were some Division One schools there. We played Boston University, Boston College, Northeastern, Harvard, and MIT, and Tufts, Babson College. So there was a mixture of Division Three, Division One, Division Two teams in that league. It's not like that now. Back then, we played a lot of Division One teams. I think that gave me an opportunity to play at a higher level, even though I was at a Division Three school. I knew I was just as good or better than a lot of these Division One schools that were across the United States. If there were a lot of Americans on any team, I knew that I was just as good or better than they were because most of the Americans just didn't have game. <laughs> they really didn't. 
Brenda won a national championship thanks to two goals from you in the championship game. What are your memories of that game? The journey there was incredible because I remember that season. We played, I think, 20 games in the regular season, and we got to our 10th game. We were undefeated, and then we lost two games in a row. Then I remember us getting it together, and after those two losses that we had, we went on to not lose another game all the way through to the championship game. We came back in overtime in, I think, the last four games leading up until the championship game. And so it was an incredible season. As far as that game was concerned, we played a team, Brockport State. They were from upstate New York. From a skill level, they were better than us. And these guys were knocking the ball around. Not to say that we weren't good. We were a good scrappy team, and we were tough. We had a good defense and a great goalie. His name was Murray Greenberg. This guy could have won pro. This guy was incredible. And he had some incredible saves. But I remember hanging in there and wearing these guys down. And my first goal, I always had people marking me the whole time. Back when I played, I was a good header. I could jump. I was very athletic. And they would cross the ball. And I would just get over everybody. And I had a lot of headers. But it came into me. And I just turned and hit it about 20 yards out and got it past the goalkeeper. And they came storming back and they were just crushing us and they scored. We went into overtime and in that game, I broke my nose. I can't remember, but at least 10, 15 minutes before the game was over, I received the ball and then I headed it down and the guy came from behind. It was like shoulder level where his foot was and hit me right in the nose. And I went down, I went out of the game. Luckily, there, when you go out, you can come back in. It's not like it is today, or when you sub out, you're done. So my coach put me in in overtime, and I ended up getting a head ball with a broken nose, by the way, and killing it in overtime. So it was a sudden death sort of thing, and right place, right time, it worked out for me. But what I remember, Rob, is, again, I appreciate the competition. It's not about winning. I like to see how you win. And I thought that that team outplayed us, to tell you the truth. But we won the game. I really respected them and how good they were. But I was happy that we took home the trophy. Sometimes it's not about who has the best individual talent, but who has the best team. That's exactly right. We have to pull it out. And the memories we have from that has been amazing over the years. My Brandeis teammates and so forth, we see each other every five or so years. We all meet back up for an my game and things like that. So those types of experiences stay with you forever. Before we get too far along here, I want to take a step back. How did your family end up in New Jersey? Because I know that you were born in Alabama. My parents, they went to school at Tuskegee in Alabama. That's where they met. I was born in Montgomery, Alabama, and my older brother, Mac, and I were baptized by Martin Luther King. We went to Martin Luther King's church. This is pre-bus boycott, all of that, when he was just a very, very young minister. And my parents participated in the bus boycott. They knew Rosa Parks. They all went to the same church. All this has been celebrated all these years, but back then, it was just people living in a community going to a church. And so... My parents, they have a lot of history when it comes to the civil rights movement and boycotting and all of that. And so we moved from Montgomery to Birmingham. And again, in Birmingham, it was very segregated then. The water fountains, we couldn't go to amusement parks. All the schools were segregated. And I didn't know any different, but it was tough. And my parents, I think, did a great job shielding us from the hatred and the ugliness of the environment that we were in. And so my mother, her sister was married to a guy in the Air Force, and he got stationed in Fort Dix, New Jersey, which was about, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes from Willingboro. And so they moved to Willingboro, and Willingboro was a growing community. Back when they moved there was a town called Levittown. And 
Levittown, the Levitts started in upstate New York where they started the first planned community. They had a Levittown in New York, then they had one in Pennsylvania, and then they had one in New Jersey. And so my aunt moved there and the school system was looking for teachers. And she called my mother and said, hey, they're hiring teachers up here. Would you like to move? And it was a lot more money than where she was working. And I think the pay was double. She was working at Miles College, which was a black college in Birmingham. And so she went up, she interviewed, she got the job and moved to New Jersey. That's how we got to New Jersey. She got a job in the Willenboro School District. My dad initially did not want to move to New Jersey. And my mom, being the mom she is, she says, okay, well, you could stay here. I'm taking the kids. We're leaving. So we got up there. She started working. And then my dad ended up coming a few months after that. And he found a job, not in Willingboro, but in a school district there in New Jersey, Pemberton. And three years later, he was able to get a job in Willingboro. And so both my parents were teachers in our town. They stayed teachers for 20 years there. And Willingboro, I think three years earlier than we got there, was segregated because Levittown was an all-white community. And there was a colonel, I believe, that was in the service uh, there at Fort Dix, but he wasn't able to move to that town. And then he sued. And he won the lawsuit, which allowed us as a Black family to move there and so that my mother could teach in that town and we can actually live in that town as well. But had not it been for others, again, paving the way, we might not have lived in that town. So I just think that my parents did the struggle and took chances to allow me and my siblings to be successful at what we did. I don't know how many people know just how good of an athlete your mom was. Yes, my mother... In the early 50s, she made the Pan American team as a hurdler. She was a great long jumper, and we're talking world-class level. And she would have made the Olympic team, but she was hurt. But back then, you had one shot, and that was it. It's not like these kids that keep training and all of that stuff today and do the next one. You had to eat, and you had to get a job and things like that. So if you could do it while you were in college, it all worked out for you. But not very many people were able to be on Olympic teams and things after their college careers. That's what happened to her. But my mother was a world-class athlete and one of the best track and field athletes in her day in the United States in the early 50s. In terms of your family, whether it's you, your older brother, Matt, Carl, your younger sister, Carol, your mom, your dad, who's the best athlete in the family? I always get asked this question, and I think Carol was the best athlete. She had the most natural ability, and she was just a natural athlete. She played volleyball or basketball, whatever she did. I think Carl was the most disciplined, and I I would consider myself disciplined as well. I just didn't play as long as he did. He took care of his body. He was very technical. The reason he won and did so well so long is because the way that he trained and took care of his body and was on top of his sport. And there are a lot of his friends that trained with him that won medals. I saw a lot of athletes come and go. They all would gravitate to him because they would train with him. He was the hardest trainer. He was the most disciplined. I can really understand why he was such a great athlete. Even to this day, I just lifted with Carl. He's strong as an ox. We bike 30 to 40 miles every Sunday to try to stay in shape and stuff like that. So I get more from him today as far as trying to get back into top fitness after I retired. Because since I retired, I've lost 35 pounds. Being able to focus back on my fitness and getting back into the groove with my brothers and biking. And I feel really good now. But when you work in corporate and you're doing that grind, it's so hard. But now you get a little bit of time to yourself to actually get fit again and feel how that used to feel. That was the greatest feeling that 
I had was playing pro and being fit and just feeling good about yourself and your body. I owe Carl a lot of that with helping me get back into tip-top fit shape. What's it like these days to be able to be around all of your siblings now that all of you are in Houston? We were very independent. I did my thing. They did their thing. We lived in different cities. This is the first time we've all lived in the same city since we really were in high school. So it feels good to be around family now. You need the support. And my mother just recently passed. Just us all being there to support everything going on with her for her last two to three years of life. It's been great for me. Sometimes I think you get real busy out there and you're doing what you want to do. You're into getting to the next level and all of these things. But I wish I would have done this earlier. But the time is now and I'm enjoying the family aspect of it and having my kids around, their uncles and aunts, and it feels good. But if you really, really want to be successful, it's hard to blend it all. Speaking of being successful, what was it like to get drafted into the NASL? Well, I was surprised I got drafted by the Cosmos. And they were like, well, we've been watching him. Nobody ever contacted me, said anything to me. Somebody called me and told me I was drafted. I was like, I had no idea. You would think that they'd call you up, hey, we're thinking about doing this. But they didn't. I was very happy because I put a lot of work in. And I thought I had a very good college career and played on a lot of all-star teams, played against a lot of other top college players and things like that. And I knew my skill level was at that level. But when I got to New York with the Cosmos, that was a great experience. And there was one American player from Trenton, New Jersey, Bobby Smith, that I knew playing in New Jersey. And he had been on the Cosmos. He had a really good career. He played in the back. We became really good friends and hanging out in New York back in the days and playing for this internationally known club. It was like one of the top clubs in the world. It was so much fun. We were going out to Studio 54 and doing all these things off the back of playing for the Cosmos, right? So when I got to training camp, you realize how skillful some of these European and South American players are. Pele had retired the year before I got there, but he was around for certain events and things like that. It was a great experience. I remember thinking, though, that I would never get a chance to play on that team. <laughs> that was my thing. I went through preseason, played some games and things like that. And so we're expansion teams all over the place looking for players. And I remember when they say, hey, we're trading you. I was so happy to get out of New York because I wanted to go to a team that was just starting that would give me an opportunity to play. It would have been very, very difficult on New York. I was happy to get on Memphis, and it was hard to play on Memphis, too, because the coaches, they would bring in all their friends. Everybody that they played with, the Over the Hill guys, it was a good old boy network sort of thing, and they had to play some of the Americans, but their best interest was not about developing American players. That wasn't it. It was like filling a gap. That's the way I felt. So I didn't play in the NFL that long. I played the first year, a half a year, a second year. And then I went and played back to New Jersey in a different league, the American Soccer League, which is sort of like the USL now. Ironically, I played for Eddie Fermani, who was the coach of the Cosmos, wasn't the coach of the Cosmos anymore. And he was the coach of New Jersey Americans. And he brought me back to them, right? So he thought that I had something that he liked. So I played there. But after that, everybody went indoor. And they had a major indoor soccer league. So all my guys, my friends at Memphis, a lot of them went indoor. And then they had all these indoor franchises starting everywhere. But it was one of the toughest things to just say, hey, it's over. I'm not going to keep chasing this. And we weren't really making any money. It was all about being a part and loving the game and all of that. Meanwhile, all my friends at Brandeis were going to grad school and medical school and getting jobs on Wall Street. I just said, hey, I need to make a decision. And again, one of the tough decisions I had to make, but I decided to hang up the boots and just play for fun and try to get my career moving. I want to follow up on a couple of things there. First, what was it like to meet Pele? 
you're in awe, but not only Pele, but I met all the great players back then. Trevor Francis and George Best and Rodney Marsh. Carlos Alberto, he played with Pele for the Brazilian team. So I used to go up against Carlos Alberto in practice. And here's a guy that was on the World Cup team. After a while, you sort of get over the starstruck stuff. But for Pele, for me, he wasn't playing with us. He came through. It was great to meet him. And when I was in Brazil, as an exchange student, my Brazilian family, we did a road trip and we drove through his town and I was able to take pictures and things like that years before I met him. But it was surreal because, I mean, this guy was a legend and he did so much. He was rich. I was in awe, but I was the kind of guy that I wouldn't let you see too much of that. <laughs> it's just how I am. You hang up your soccer cleats. Where did you decide to go from there? I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So I got a job working for a company, Gun and Bradstreet, as an analyst, entry-level corporate job. Did that for a few years. And then Dave Grimaldi was on with a company that was starting up in New Jersey called People Express. I don't know if you remember them, but he says, hey, with this brand new airline, you should come. And we're starting this company. There's a lot of positions. And I stopped and went and worked for People Express. It was a great experience. And that airline, I think when I got there, they had like 30 planes. They grew it to like 200 planes and the company just exploded. And we moved up in management and did a lot of things to help that airline grow. You saw that entrepreneurial spirit going and building and things like that. I, I met a lot of really good people. And that was in the 80s. And I worked there for five years and got to travel all over the world, did a lot of traveling, which I love because at our soccer days, we were always on a plane. I got this bug of getting around the world. Occasionally, I'll be on a plane and I'll see a flight attendant or somebody, a pilot or whatever, that used to work with me back in the 80s, and they're just retiring. But I got out of the airline business and got into sales. I wanted to be a stockbroker to take that next level in career choices. And that was around 87, 88. And the market crashed around that time. And then I ended up getting into telecommunication sales, IT, cloud, for about 35 years. And when I got in, there was no internet. <laughs> And there wasn't even really corporate email then on the structure it is today. And so was able to get in and sold long distance. I ended up working for MCI for a number of years in management, director, running sales teams in multiple states and so forth. I left and got with a startup company, a company called CBion. And I was employed like number 35. And we grew that company to a $500 million company, and I ran all of their sales nationally, which was a great experience for me, working on the senior team there and developing that company. And then from there, that kept me with that entrepreneurial spirit. When I left there, we started another company, and this was about 2013, called Pax8, a cloud distribution company, a cloud marketplace, if you will which is one of the top small companies in the U.S. today. We were able to build that company. There were seven of us at the beginning. And this was one of those stories where we were in somebody's house on a whiteboard type of thing to where we grew this thing to where we have, I think, around 17, 1,800 employees now. We're in multiple countries and one of the top cloud marketplaces in the market today. And so I've been very, very fortunate to be associated with a lot of really smart people and to bring my expertise to be able to start sales and training programs for multiple startups. I just retired from Pax8 and very fortunate to be there and be one of the financial leaders there in the very, very beginning. And it was kind of tough getting it going, but it looks like things are going to work out for us well. So I had a really, really good career, I think, in cloud and IT services. And I think a lot of my athletic prowess has helped me along the way, being competitive. I think going back to my brand ice years, I'm lucky that I was able to get out of sports and transition and use my academics to take me to senior level positions in the corporate world. 
with your love of travel and your love of hawker, did you go to the World Cup last year? I did. Very fortunate. I got to go. I went to all the U.S. games. And that was my second time in Doha. It's a beautiful city. I know there was a lot of controversy around it and everything, but it was a wonderful trip. And there's a lot of soccer players moving that way, and they're trying to develop their league. It's someone to reckon with as far as how they're trying to push sports and hospitality over there. But I had a wonderful time. I thought it was a good World Cup. The venues were just beautiful. I can't wait to the next World Cup because I was very proud of the Americans. Finally, we have a squad that is on par with the European teams. And I don't think I could say that. And I can honestly say now that I feel our players is on par with any team. And most of those players are playing in Europe for top teams now. It's not like they're intimidated when they come up against players like Mbappe or Neymar or any of the top players that are in the English league. They play with these guys day in, day out. So I'm really proud of the U.S. And then when they do have the World Cup here in the United States, I'm going to go to as many games as I can. I want to go to one in Mexico, and I want to go to one in Canada as well. But depending on what the U.S. is playing and where they are and who's in their group and things like that, I want to see the U.S. play. But I think this time I will try to go to more games and to uh, see other teams. One thing we haven't talked about is, are you okay with being sometimes called Carl Lewis's brother instead of being called Cleve Lewis? Great question. And I think some of the other folks that you talk to go through this. I went through it all the time. <laughs> Not only that, people at my work would call me Carl sometimes. <laughs> but yeah, I'm good with that. I mean, here's a guy that's one of the most popular athletes in the world, right? I mean, what are you going to do? I didn't do that. People know who he is. So I think it's great. And by being called that, I was proud, put it that way. And so I didn't like to hear that, but I mean, really get over it. We had a very good relationship. I'm not jealous or any of that type of thing. I did my own thing. And see, and when we were younger, we looked a lot alike. And people would come up to me randomly and on a plane. Are you Carl Lewis? And I was like, no, people tell me that all the time. I wouldn't get into, no, that's my brother. I would just say, yeah, people tell me that all the time. I think if you're in a position that somebody's that popular to where they relate you to him, then I was good with that. What's a favorite story away from the athletic fields that you have with your brother? That's a good question. A lot of the trips that we have, I wouldn't say there's a favorite story, but we travel and do trips and stuff a lot. And we have a lot of fun just doing regular family stuff and laughing. And it's silly things that we laugh about. Carl and myself, we have a sick sense of humor. My brother Max a little bit different, so sometimes he's the brunt of the jokes. But I just love being around family. And there's so many stories, it's just hard to choose one. Cleve, I want to thank you for joining the I Play 2 podcast this week and sharing your soccer stories and growing up in New Jersey. Everything's been great. Thank you so much, and congratulations on your retirement. Well, thank you very much, Rob, for having me. It feels good to go back and reminisce and talk about all these things and appreciate being on your show today. Thank you very much.